<laughs> Good morning, afternoon, evening, ladies and gentlemen. John just gave me the sign that we are supposed to start the program on time here today. Yeah, if we don't start on time, John starts doing this right here at the end of the program, and I always feel he'll cut his neck off, so we've got to start on time and <laughs> got to also end on time. Well, we're back again for another edition of What's Going On, <clears throat> excuse me, on AllPointsTV.com. And we are slowly but surely, or as it surely and slowly, becoming the number one network on, let's see, what can we be claim number one for? We can't claim uh, number one for cable news because that's the rally factor. <laughs> we can't. We can't claim that, so let's see. We have to kind of study up on this thing here, and we'll we'll find something we're number one at. Maybe maybe the number one program that starts on time, because as soon as that clock strikes uh, two o'clock, we up and running and ready to go. And right here in our favorite st studio, AllPointsTV.com. And as I just said a minute ago, I'm George Moss, the host of the program that comes on every Monday when I'm in the country. And every second and fourth Mondays, we are privileged to be the program that precedes Satora's Black History Corner that comes on at 3.30. And they uh, hang around, often too briefly, from about 3.30 to 4. Wish they had a much longer program because they are very good at what they do. The two Catherines, that's Miss Catherine Hunter Blake and Miss Catherine, Miss Catherine Hunter Blake. Miss Catherine Blake and Miss Catherine Hunter Williams. And I only advertise their program because they pay me after the show is over. <laughs> but I, I don't get paid for it. I, I'm, I'm, I rush home after this program is over every, every two Mondays and I go, rush home to watch their program live. Well, I have to tell you something about the post I just put up before coming to the studio. <clears throat> I think that this post which it just did and finished about um, 25 minutes ago. And they had to rush out of there, out of my office, and then rush to the studio to do this program here. But I think this is one of my best narratives on Facebook, at least in quite some time. And I, I wrote about this uh, shooting outside of Houston, where this police officer was killed. And nobody can figure out the motive. I was coming to the studio and I was listening to one of the programs that they had a, a news alert and they were saying that they're getting ready to arraign this guy. His name, his name is uh, Shannon J. Miles. And what's the officer's name? Darren. I usually write, like to remember these names. <clears throat> uh, anyway, this officer that was killed, I think he had two children and was, uh, of course, a family man. And everyone is trying to figure out just what could the motive be. This man sneaked up behind a police officer who was filling his patrol car up with gas. And this guy, in a premeditated way, went, snuck up behind him, gun drawn, and when he got close enough, opened fire on this guy and shot him in the back. And then while he was down, shot him several more times, one of which was in his head. And the closest they can get to a motive was the sheriff saying, I think his name is Sheriff Hicks, <clears throat> that said that he was shot while in uniform. But they just can't quite get the motive as to what might have motivated him to do that. Now, they had no problem in getting the motive when Dallin Roof went into this church in South Carolina. And he sat there for 45 minutes and they had welcomed him into the church and treated him with, with kindness and opened up the church uh, as if he were a friend of all of those who were there. And while he was on the run, and he had identified him through the cameras that had taken his picture while he was up there at the door of the church, they went through a side door and had that on camera. They didn't have any uh, problem identifying that he was there and what his motives were. And they were all 
already putting out that this was racism that explained it. But in this case, we just can't figure it out. It's too complex. And the complexity is that liberals just can't bring their mouths to mouth the words that racism in this country cuts both ways. And that if they say, for example, that this shooting of this white police officer by this black person named uh, Shannon Miles, Shannon J. Miles, <clears throat> then you got to then change the racial narrative, at least to some extent, where you now have to say that blacks can be racist also. And what liberal wants to make, make that claim? Do you know what I read too that, that they actually when they gave out the uh, description of this individual, you know, the Shannon, I guess as they identified him now, that they actually didn't say use the term black or African American. They actually used the word dark complected. <laughs> that's right. So, so I mean, even I mean, John, that's right. I mean, it's like it's like, okay, I could see using you not the derogatory terms, not using them. I can understand that, but um, I, I thought that the description of the suspects is what a law, LEO law enforcement officer was supposed to be engaging in and. This is being this is a, this ham type of hamstring is just ridiculous. It is ridiculous, John. Look at what they did with George Zimmerman when they when they simply changed his racial identification, and his dark complected fits fits right into what liberals do when what happens does not fit the narrative, which is that blacks are under siege in the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they did all kinds of things in that case, and they're doing it, all, doing it again. A little bit more subtle in this case here. You have to catch them at it, and I think I caught them at it and okay. wrote about it in my post today. I, okay, but see, you grew up in the, the, you know, the pre-desegregated South days, mm -hmm. down South. Yeah. And you came North, you heard, you know, into Michigan. Yeah, no, okay, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, I, I'm sure that sometimes, because I've, I've had cops go abuse, go get abusive with me, mm -hmm. okay? And I've, I was very polite. They started going off me, threatening to kill me and stuff. For the, uh, they're on power trips. But, I mean, okay, it, there are probably instances, and I'm just assuming, because, I mean, I've heard this so often from blacks, that um, they had these issues with uh, cops. So you never had any uh, pro cop give you any bad attitude or threaten you or anything? Or? No, I, I've had a bad experience with police officers, but I individuated just like I do everything else in terms of uh, putting it within the corridors of that particular situation. I don't make it that it's everybody that's doing that to me. And I've had some situations that I've had to think my way out of, and I, I had to figure out what was the best approach in terms of what was happening out there on the street. <clears throat> but I do understand is that person, that officer, that situation, and that time. I, I'll tell you what, what happened to me. At, at, uh, I was at a uh, at one of the coffee shops. One of my friends liked to go to this uh, one, one coffee shop. And it really doesn't matter which one as long as they're serving the same coffee. The one that burns the coffee. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't particularly care for it myself, but you know, he invites me out to coffee and it was, and it's, it was his time to pay this last time, so I had to go on that one. Because I, I, we, we, I, I guess the way it works there, you put $5 into this, uh, whatever that thing is they do, and they, 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 they do the uh, points. And then they get so many points for having credit on their account and we always, I was, you know, I buy the coffee every t every other time. It's my time to buy the coffee. Well, it was his time to buy the coffee this time. So I was not going to miss that. I had to go to, I had to go get my coffee. But I, I was sitting at, I was sitting, we were sitting at the table and they have these long tables now because uh, this particular coffee shop expects you to come there and sit for a while, have your conversation, drink your coffee, you enjoying yourself. And it's a place, it's a nice place to go and have, you know, conversation. You meet a lot of people in there. But I was sitting there, and I looked out the window, and there was this police officer getting out of his car. And I told my two friends that were sitting at the table, I said, watch this. And I went over to the door. I didn't stand in front of the door. I stood on the side, and when the officer came in, because a single officer, I asked him to get out of his car, when he came in the coffee shop, I put my hand out there and shook his hand. Now I told my friends, I said, now watch this. And I told them to watch this because I knew what was going to happen once I did that. And sure enough, once I put my hand out there, the officer shook my hand. And then when we went to the counter to offer his coffee, I went back to, my, my, to the table and took my, my seat. And that officer, John, could not stop talking to me. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he could not stop looking over there, and he could—he couldn't hardly offer his 
uh, 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 give the order for his coffee because he had to talk to me and let me know that he appreciated it and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was like a long conversation. And he didn't want to leave either. And I've gotten that particular reaction a couple of times. So I have to tell you something. I, I've had both experiences. And I understand the other experience. But I think that in that other case where you've had that other experience, because it does, it's not always good because it's not always the same people. And when it's not good, the question is, what do you do to make it better? Because it can be bad out there. But my, my role, I, I was stopped over here uh, in Otisville. And I mean, how many blacks out there? And at 2 o'clock in the morning, what blacks are riding around the street late at night, really early in the morning in that case, and you're not going to draw some suspicion uh, coming out of there. And I, I was at a light, and the officer was next to me. He was over there parked to my left, and I was over there on the right side at the light. We both were stopped. Couldn't have been speeding because if I had been speeding, it would have pulled up behind me and gave me a ticket. We were on the same side. So the light changed. I went through the light, and then he pulled him back me and put the light on me because he had a question, I'm sure. And I knew that this was going to be harassment because I wasn't doing anything wrong. And I knew I was out there in a, on a dark street in the back of the booth in the dark. And I knew that I had to think my way through it before I stopped. So I kept going, but I went at a, at a speed where it could not be conjured up that I was trying to get away. I went at a very moderate speed, about between 5 and 10 miles an hour. But I was going to a place where when I finally stopped, I would pull into a parking lot where there was adequate license, light, lighting because it was very dark on that street. So I went, there was a, there was a, it wasn't a 7-Eleven, but it was one of those, those um, parking lots, a real large parking lot, and it had a lot of flags out there, not, not the, like the American flag or some other kind of flag, just little flags that would uh, be, be able to say, hey, we're here, we're open. So I pulled in there, and sure enough, the provocation came almost instantly when he got out of his car. And came to my, to my, I had my window rolled down to make sure my, my, my hands were visible. And I took those kind of precautions, put my hand on the steering wheel, and couldn't be any doubt about the fact that I was going to comply with whatever his instructions were. And he came to, to the window, and he began to provoke me. He said, um, let me see your driver's license in that particular tone. Then he said, then before I could reach my driver's license, <laughs> he said, oh, you don't have it, huh? And... He didn't even know if he didn't know whether I hit it or not because he said it like that, just rapid fire. And let me see your driver's license. Oh, you don't have it, huh? So I knew what was going on, and I knew that I had to uh, to fight him with my mind. I was fighting him. He didn't know I was fighting him. <clears throat> and then when I told him I do have it, I told him the, low, the the louder he got, by the way, the quieter I got. The louder he got in talking to me, the the calmer I was in responding to him. So he got loud and I got quieter in terms of response. He almost had to, he had, he had to almost put his ear in my car <laughs> to hear what I was saying. Because I got, the louder he got, the, the calmer I, I got. I was going to force my calmness on him. I was going to impose myself in his space. See, he had come up there, <laughs> he had come up there and imposed himself in my space. You know what I was doing? I was imposing myself in his space. It was quid pro quo. I had some power too. He didn't understand the power I was using. He understood his power. I wanted to understand my power. <laughs> and so he then asked me, because I had the driver's license, I told him I do have the license, and I showed it to him. Then he wanted to see my insurance papers. And you don't have it, huh? And I had that too. And I told him I had it in the glove compartment. And I made sure he knew I was going to, I was reaching to get it. I showed him that. So he kept on and kept on and kept on. It went off about five minutes. Didn't I didn't it didn't it didn't move me. I wasn't provoked. I kept my focus on what I was supposed to be doing out there. I didn't I couldn't control what he was doing. I could, well I could control what he was doing by controlling what I was doing. And I knew I was gonna control what he was doing by controlling what I was doing. I did not let him provoke me. And I knew that eventually that guy would have to let me go because I had not done anything wrong. But I had a driver's license that had faded. They used to have those kind that fade on the front. So I had gone back to the Secretary of State's office and I had them put on the back. They typed in on the back of the paste on the back. 
the information that, that had faded out, so I had it on the back. He claimed that my driver's license was mutilated, took my driver's license, told me he's given me two tickets, one for speeding and one for having a mutilated driver's license, which he took, and told me to have a nice day. And then followed me for about 10 miles, and then I went, you know, very slow rate of speed. He broke off the contact and uh, stopped the pursuit. But what he didn't know was that I was out there the whole time fighting him. And I knew while he was out there doing what he was doing, what I was doing is I already gotten past the thing in the street. I knew I was going to be able to deal with that, so that was no problem. What I was already doing was thinking about Monday, because that happened on Saturday night. And Monday morning, I was down there in the courtroom. I knew then I'd see him in court. And when I brought him to court, what happened, I had a newspaper at that time, what happened was that when I went before the judge, and that's a long story, I'll make it short by just saying, when I went before the judge, the judge said, well, I have to, I may have to disqualify myself because Mr. Moss is one of the persons that supported me in my campaign for the judgeship. And now the prosecutor that was uh, defending the police officer and myself found out I wasn't just some Johnny come lately on the street. I mean, I was dressed that way. It was a certain night. I wasn't dressed in my, in my school attire. I always wore a shirt and tie when I was in school. And, and I always wore a coat. I, you, I was never in the classroom without a coat on and wore a shirt, without a shirt and tie. That was just the way I dressed. But on, on the weekend, I would dress with, uh, you know, just a shirt. I never wore my hat backwards, so that was not part of it. But if I had a hat on, it was always turned this way. But, I, but in my uniform in school, my professional uniform was always a shirt and tie, a coat, usually a suit, very seldom a sport coat. And um, sometimes the, the tie wouldn't be matching, but I would have a tie on. And the students would say, Miss Mars, you should have wore that tie yesterday with the other suit. <laughs> but I was uh, out there. And when I went to court, the people in the courtroom were saying, wait a minute, Mr. Moss is here. What are you here for, Mr. Moss? And the guys and the judge said, I have to tell you that I may have to disqual disqualify myself because Mr. Moss supported me in my campaign. And I may have to, I have to let you know ahead of time that, I'm, I, I, that he did you know, support me. And they told the judge that they believed that he was going to be fair and there was not a problem. Now they want to negotiate. But I don't want to negotiate at this point because I want them to produce that driver's license because if they, I couldn't prove that I wasn't speeding because that's his word against my word. But if I can, but I can invoke his word against his word if that which was visible, which was a driver's license, was not in fact uh, mutilated, which it wasn't, and I had the information on the back of it. If that in fact was not true, and that could be proven by him producing the driver's license. Then the other was probably could be impugned as, as well as not being true. And when he could not produce a driver's license, he could have produced it, but if he had produced it, it would have contravened his argument that I was out there acting uh, untoward on the street and also acting unbecoming in terms of having a driver's license that was no longer valid because it mutilated. If, if one is not true, then the chances of the other not being true is probably um, false also. And I just asked him to produce the driver's license. And when he couldn't produce it, that was a problem. And so I, so my, I, I want to say that to say this. You can have um, bad experience on the street. They can get worse. And you got to understand, and I say this to the judge, I said that um, uh, because when the, because I I, I, had another, I had another case uh, where I had uh, gotten a ticket. And I told that 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 particular officer I'll see you in court. Uh, that was over there off of uh, Beecher Road. He he was a uh, park uh, facing that way, and I was going in that direction. He claimed he was able to put to turn his um, radar to the back of him and pick me up at speed. And that was another situation, and I knew he could. He had not done that, and he claimed. And I, when I went down the side street, he came out of there and then went and back him in and put the light on me and and and, and gave me a ticket. I was, on, I was on my way to school. I wasn't going to be late for that because I, at that time I was a principal, and I had to be there a certain time, and I wanted to make sure I got that before the students were there. And he gave me a ticket, and I told him that I wasn't speeding, and I, and, and I think you know I wasn't speeding, and I told him that I'll see you in court. And when I got to court, 
Uh, in that case, it was another situation that came up where there was a case before man with the same police officer. He had given this guy a break, gave me the full weight of the ticket, but he claimed that it was because I was um, acting um, in a belligerent way. And I said to the, and the, and the judge asked me, he said, uh, Mr. Moss, um, um, were, you, were you speeding? I said, no, I wasn't speeding. He said, well, uh, well then, you call, then you're saying that this, this police officer targeted you because of your race. I said, I can't say that because I don't know this officer. But then when the officer said that I was talking back to him, I told the judge this. Now I can say that this officer is lying because I don't carry myself that way. And I said that I'm over some students and I, that's my job. And I have some people under me and he has respect, on the, he has authority on the street. And I said, I respect that. He makes his living one way. I make my living another way. And so that happened in that case. My point is this though. My point is you have to know how to dig. If somebody got a shovel and they're digging um, a grave for you, you have a shovel too. And just dig, <laughs> and just dig your way out of it. You know, I, I read a, a case in, um, you know, in the Middle East. It was a case of... Um, this, this one guy that was traveling in, in the Middle East, in, I think it was in Egypt. I know it was in the, in the desert, in the Sahara Desert. And the way these uh, Arabs would operate was that they would tell you that they want you to give them so much graft and you got to hand over some of your cash or something you got to hand over in your possession. Or they, if you said, no, let's start digging a, a grave. And they go and start digging and you know they plan on putting you in there. So this one guy, what he did was... He took out his shovel, had it in his backpack, went over there and started digging another grave. And he started digging their grave. And when they saw that they were there digging, they looked over and saw him digging, then they decided that maybe that's not a good idea. And so if a person has a hammer, you know how uh, they got that book out called, you know, Hank Aaron said, I had a hammer. Yeah, the other guy had a ball. And he was throwing it at him, throwing it at the plate. But he had a hammer. And he hit 755 home runs with the hammer that he had. They had the ball. They used to ask him, uh, when you went to the plate, what did you look for? They thought he was going to say the curve ball or the fast ball or the change of pace, or the change up. He said, when I went to the plate, I looked for the ball. That's what the pitcher had. He had another thing. He had a, he had a, he had a bat. And the bat is, you know, it's like, you know, the paper covers rock, rock. Breaks and scissors, scissors cut paper. You got to understand that. And I understood that. I'm, I'm saying there's a way to get out of it. That's what I'm saying. And you have to know how to, how to do that. I have friends that are very good at it. And they told me about some of the experiences. And we often talk about it. And they tell me about what, how they went through a situation. I had a friend that was telling me, you know, Ohio. We beat y'all this year too down there. You know, we're going to take y'all to the, to the woodshed. We got... Hargrove is our is our coach this year. So we're taking it, we're taking it, we're taking it to you this year. Starting Thursday when we play, I think we're playing Utah. That's the first victory. We're gonna walk all over them. And they're gonna think we got our golf shoes on when we get through. We're gonna we're gonna stomp on them. <laughs> Knock on wood. But you know we, we got we got this. I'm talking about this mindset that we can't get through stuff. I had a friend went down to Ohio, went through Ohio. He was taking his family down to visit uh, his his. Let's see, was it his in, no his his mom his mom and dad. And you know, you go Ohio, go to Ohio. They know how you think in Michigan. We they see in Michigan is a different kind of mindset. The mindset we have in Michigan is different than the mindset in Ohio. They expect you to understand that the speed limit says uh, 55 or if it says 65, they, they're not talking about 70. But up here in Michigan, you know, if, if, if they see, if they got a speed limit that says 70 and they see you doing 75, the police officers here that's on the side see you speed by 75, just five miles on the speed limit, they practically wave at you. Down in Ohio, they see a, see a, a a blue tag that has Michigan on it, and they know how you think up here. And you got that, particularly get that hat. 
they know that they can, they got they got somebody now that just don't understand that this is not Michigan and you're gonna try to do five miles over. That's that that's our mentality. And I've been stopped by them and so on and so forth because of that mentality. And I was bragging about it. I was saying, I was going to just do it five miles over the speed limit. He told me, yeah, speed limit is, uh, I was only doing five miles over. He said, yeah, the speed limit is 60. So my friend was stopped. He was going down to visit his, his, his folks, carrying his children down there, wanted to meet their, the, 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 be with the grandparents for a while. He said, when they stopped me, he said, George, I, I, we, you know, we talked about this, and I did everything that we had talked about. He said, I had my hands on the steering wheel, turned the light on before he got to the car. He asked me, where was I going, and did I know I was doing this, that, and the other, and five miles over the speed limit. I told him that I wasn't aware of it, but if you say I was, then that's what I was doing. And the guy talked to him a few minutes, trying to figure out his attitude. He found his attitude was pretty good. He said, I, two minutes later, I was rolling again back on the street. <laughs> I mean, it's not always that good, right? But I understand that much of that, uh, when I'm seeing in these videos, much of that is on the persons that is out there acting like Michael Brown. I can tell you right now, if you try to do what Michael Brown did, and they talk about hands up, don't shoot, and all that black lives matter, I can tell you right now, you're going to get shot. Now, there's some out there, just like, and I don't even have to say this, because you have bad eggs in every every. Um, in every uh, area. I wish it was as few bad eggs on the police department as it would be like in our government. That's a problem. John, I need some, you got some tissue out there, John? You know, I should have done that before I came, before I got on air. We were so busy trying to start on time that I had to get on air and then come up here and then embarrass myself in front of, in front of the audience. But I, I have to tell you something that um, you have to continue to be in control is the a, is a, is a main thing. And don't give up the power that you will in those situations. And I have not given up my power. That's why I have never gotten hit on my head. Although I understand that the intent may be, may be that. But I have an intent also. And I have a t I have, my intent is uh, for some reason different from his intent. And that intent is not to get, eat, not get hit on my head. I don't like getting hit on my head. That, that hurts. <laughs> and so I'm trying not, not, not to go there. Uh, and, and not be and not be one of the persons that have been there and done that. I don't want to go there and do that because I don't like pain. I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm not. A, I'm not. A, I'm not into too much um, masochism myself. You know, I don't like nobody beating on me. Excuse me, one second. When I get here from here on in, I'm going to make sure when I get here that I've taken care of all my hygienic needs. Because I get on the air, and I do hear about this, people say, man, look, you had all that time, you get to the studio early, and you get on, on there, and then look what you're doing. Well, I, I agree with you on that one. I, I, sometimes, you know, I just don't, I mean, sometimes you don't even understand your, your physical condition. But I, but I'll tell you something, you know, in most cases, I try to make sure I'm in control of my space. And I would recommend that to anyone. When I talk to people about that, in fact, I used to teach that to my students. Stay, stay, in, stay in charge. You stay in charge of your space. Try to get that under control first. And it's amazing how many of them I run into. And uh, how many of them, um, I mean, I see them on Facebook all the time and uh, one person was writing about something that happened in class and uh, subliminal seduction. We had had a, had a, a, a class on that one day, and he was uh, seeing something in, in a commercial, and he was he posted it and said, "I learned this in uh, Mr. Moss's class." And I, I said, "Wrote back." First of all, I didn't respond to it, but he put it on my wall so I would see it. And then when he did that, I had to respond to it. And I said, um, you remember that after, that after all these years? Because it was some years before I taught that. <clears throat> I mean, that's years and years ago. But he said, yeah, but I, I, I remember it because I met the situation. And it was subliminal seduction, which I, um, I remember uh, having mentioned the three volumes written by Wilson Brian Key, who was a Canadian writer. And I mentioned these three volumes in the classroom that day and showed them some of the ways in which it operates so they can begin to see more clearly things that were manipulative in the environment, particularly on, these, on, these, on television where they advertise uh, these different things, getting you to buy the product. 
and why you can't resist because of the kind of uh, subliminal messaging that they put in, in their in their commercials. But I wanted, to be, but I but I was trying to get them to be in charge of the space also, and that was part of, of what I would do in the classroom. Stay in charge, and you'll find that whatever situa situation you're in, if you act powerfully, then you put the other person in check. And that my friend was telling me that that's what I, a lot a lot of my friends have had those situations and. They uh, uh, laugh about it and say, you know, two minutes later, this one guy was telling me, and I was back on the street rolling. He said, my family was okay and all of that. Uh, by the way, let me, let me uh, uh, since I'm on this point, let me, let me uh, ask you about this, this. Have you seen this film called The Great Debaters? Now, I don't know if you've seen this. this the, uh, if you saw the film, you might not have seen that one, that one scene. But uh, what, would hap what happened that one scene, now this is in the Deep South. Uh, back in 1935, you know, when they when they were when when at Wiley College, now they had it. They had they had Wiley, they they had the they had the school supposedly going up against Harvard, but they didn't go up against Harvard. They went up against um, uh, I think they went up a school went up against the school in California, in in the great debate. But what they did in this one scene is that, and this is this is a true story. They had this one this this this. Um, College uh, professor at teaching at a, at a black college, driving down the street, and they had it so that the dead pig would be out there on the street, and they're going to claim that this professor hit the pig and killed these people's pig. Now he has a check that his wife had signed over to him, and they came out and said, "You hit our pig." And you're going to have to pay for that. And he had this check in his, um, in his pocket. Knowing that he was being accused of something he had not done. And his son, seeing his dad being falsely accused and knew his dad was falsely accused. And was out there trying to defend his dad. His dad says, Junior, get in the car. And Junior, by the way, was James Farmer. That's a true story. His dad was James Farmer Sr., but Junior was James Farmer, who later on would come out of Wiley College and set up the, the, up the civil rights group called CORE in 1942, the Congress of Racial Equality, the ones on that debate team who would later on debate Malcolm X. That's why he thought he could debate, debate Malcolm. He never won any of them, but that's where he got the courage to even even uh, try it. Of course, later on, the word got out: don't don't debate this guy because he didn't go to school like we did. Therefore, he doesn't think in a box like we do, and that could be that could be dangerous. But he told his, his son, Junior, get in the car. Well, Junior felt his, his dad was being mistreated. He wanted to stand there and defeat his dad. I mean, he wanted to defend his dad. His dad told him, Junior, get in the car, and he saw his dad writing the check, signing the check over to these people making this false accusation. And when he got in the car to drive off, Junior had his mouth open, thinking his dad had been an Uncle Tom. He backed down. Dad, I mean, he had that look on his face, disappointed in his dad. Thought his dad should, should fight. And his dad turned around and he said to him, Junior, the next time I tell you to get in the car, you get in the car. And that was instructive, very instructive. You know why it was instructive? Because there are some fights you cannot win. And the dad knew it and the son didn't know it. And he taught that to his son. You can't win every situation. You, look, you win the ones you can. And you have to understand the ones you can't win, at least in that particular situation. That's a great film for, for, for that kind of instruction, by the way. There's a lot of different little scenes in it that if you pay attention to it, there's a lot of learning in it. Because there was a time when you had to be careful. And when I do part two of this article I'm working on, that I worked on today, I did part one today, and I wrote about this, this police officer that was killed in, in Houston, that the three blind mice can't understand why this officer was killed by this black person that was unprovoked in this premeditated murder of this officer. But nobody can understand what it was. He was, although the police chief Hicks said he was uh, in uniform, in his police uniform, but he couldn't figure out what the motive was. So I asked a question in my post, was it because, could it have been because the uniform had buttons on it? Could that have been it? What about how he wore his collar? Could that have been the case? They just can't figure it out.
But he had no problem figuring out, you know, Dylan. Dylan Roof. We knew what the motive was there, but couldn't figure out the motive here. And so I've had some experiences, but it does not color my ability to be objective because I understand what that was about. And the paper came out and said, were they too quick to assume that Black Lives Matter might have had something to do with it? Did they rush a judgment too soon? No, you didn't rush a judgment too soon. And that's exactly what it was about. If you can figure out Dowd on Roof, you can figure this one out too. And I wrote about it in my Facebook post, one of my best posts that I have done at least in some time. They're all good, I must say that. They're not always as good as I should make it because I am sometimes rushing to other events. But when I get a chance to read and proofread what I write and then clean up some of the things that I may have, uh, have overlooked because some words look the same when I'm not wearing my glasses on the screen. You may see an I and think it's an E and all of that. But when I get it proofread and go back over it again, it's, it's pretty much what I want, how I want to read. And this one was one of my best ones, I think. And I already got some, some people commenting upon it. And I'm just saying this to you to, for this reason. That you have to be honest you know, in, in life. You have to be honest. Honest with yourself. And let the chips fall where they may. You know, people just don't get it uh, in reading my post. I, I had an egghead on my post the other day. And he got on there. I won't call his name out. Uh, but he got on my post and, and wanted to tell me what gave me a what for. And I'm supposed to get off of my agenda. And, you know, you apologize. And I, and I, and I don't apologize. When I, when I write what I write. And I'm sure of what my claims are because I think about it before I do it. I, I may think about it the, the night before. I'm thinking about it in terms of how I'm going to uh, approach it and attack the subject. I may, may do that the day before. I don't, I don't always write about what I write on the day that I write about it. I may think about it the night before, go to bed thinking about it. And maybe even in my subconscious, I'm working it out as how it's going to read and how the paragraph is going to flow because the fluence has got to be there. I kept, have to make sure my and Mrs. Reed's uh, name, I have to make sure that she's represented in my writing. And I have to make sure I'm fluent. But when I put it down on, on that paper, I said what I want to say. And, and those waiting for an apology uh, for it, I can tell you right now, you ain't getting one. <laughs> and that's what, and, and, and I tell you, in, in the political arena, that's why I like Donald Trump, Donald Trump so much. And I think Donald Trump, quite frankly, for a lot of reasons, I think Donald Trump's the next president of the United States. I think the American people are ready for, for this. I mean, are you ready for this? What's that guy's name, the magic guy, the guy that does the magic show? Are you ready for this? I don't know that one, but I was going to say, um, I've been seeing people predict that uh, Trump's uh, number is going to fall, and but they're really outraged that um, the, the GOP establishment is really outraged. <laughs> yeah. We're not a taking the pro-offered uh, other Bush, you know, Bush to uh, yeah. you know, yeah, Bush is way down there. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, 6%. Yeah. You know, of, you know the he, Trump polls, but I mean. He's going he's to fade it even more. John. We don't want in another, I mean, what, I mean, who threatened his It ain't going to happen. Who's gonna, who threatened his mom somewhere? Or John. Yeah, you know. John, you know it as well as I do. You pay attention to these political uh, things that are taking place. There is a, there is an American revolt going on. Have you picked that up? Look huh? at the, look at, look at, the, look at the three people in the, Leadership in the Republican prime and that's leading going toward the primary. There's, uh, you know, I just heard coming to the studio that Donald Trump and Dr. Ben Carson are tied at 23 percent in a piece in uh, tied for first place. Both of them got 23 percent. Now that's 46 percent right there. And then number three is Kali Firiana. She has about eight percent. And if you listen to her, you know why. I don't know. I, I see what CNN is doing, though. They're trying to go with the number she had in the first primary. And they're trying to say in the first uh, debate, saying, well, your numbers weren't X, Y, and Z. In the first um, debate that went on, you were in the second tier of the debate. We're going with those numbers rather than these numbers. The reason why they're doing that is because they don't want a woman on stage because the, the narrative, John, the narrative in the Democratic Party is that the Republicans hate women. You know, that's what she pulled the other day. Look at, she was comparing the, the Republicans to the Taliban and to ISIS and ISIL 
And who's this? Hillary? Or? Hillary's doing oh, that. Th this is a lot of crap. I mean, and, and it's like a, it's so. If you just look at the history of the Republican Party, they had more women involved in the higher level of the political structure of the GOP for years before the Democrats did. Way before. Way so, before, I mean, John. Yeah. John, it is a it. Look, these people are coming out of the woodwork. We see both the Democrats and the Republicans coming out of the woodwork because what you have in Washington is that you got a brotherhood of the two parties in Washington. And and these persons are coming from the outside. They got their mouths open on both sides. The GOP just better offer up somebody that they could be, not they're really happy with, but they know that it resonates well with the people because they act like, they were, I mean, we're supposed to be a lockstep. We're going to offer it to you and you got to accept this because this is what we like. Well, I don't like Bush. I never, I didn't like Bush one. I didn't like Bush two. And I detest Bush three because I, I, three times not the charm. Okay. George the third. George the third. I mean, my God. I mean, we're just going to be soon. Uh, Chelsea Clinton. Basically, we're just going to have three, <laughs> three political families running the entire country. We already have that with the Rockefellers. We have that locally with the Regals. We also have that with, you know, we have that with the uh, Stabenow's probably got some kid in the wing. <laughs> Dingle's been in power for what? Almost, they're going to top out over 100 years. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, why? That's, that's the Michigan family. You know, uh, John Dingo, that family, his dad was in the office for 29 years. His dad was the one who he saw the signing of the uh, Social Security Act. Yeah, I know yeah. he was. That and does FDR's terms. Yeah, FDR's yeah. terms. And then his son was in there uh, 58 years, 29 terms. And. Then his, his wife is in there now. So that family owns the seat, don't they? I, I know. Basically, what, what they're going to just abolish the elections, just give that to life. They're going to have grandkids coming to power and taking the power reins. I mean, I'm sick of these political career politicians yeah. and their kinfolk. And so, and finally, I, and, that, and that's why I, I was, I was going to say when I first got here to the studio that I, uh, for the first time in, in, in seven years, uh, I'm proud, I'm proud of, um, of the American people. <laughs> you know, I wasn't too proud after 2000. And uh, nine, I mean, I voted for Obama. I'm not going to lie about that. I voted for him in 2008. I wasn't drinking the Kool-Aid and believing all that nonsense he was talking about. But I just thought, I didn't think the man could be this bad. I, I guess, again, like, I was just like Donald Trump. I, I knew he didn't have any experience, and I knew a lot of what he was saying was lying. But I thought at least he would use his particular oratorical skills and just use his crusade-type movement that he had going, because that was a crusade going on in 2002, like it's going on right now in, the, in this campaign for 2016. And that campaign was one in which people had lashed on to the idea that this man was bringing about change in the country. Hadn't been in Washington that long, and only been in there two years uh, as a senator before he started running for the presidency. So he thought, well, he wasn't corrupted by the, by the political system in, in Washington. And we could use him as a battering ram to stop some of the politics going on in the Beltway. Only to find out he was disguised, more so than we thought he was. And we're getting what we're getting right now. So I haven't been too proud of, of, uh, of where we are for a while. But for the first time in a long time, I am proud of the American people to the, uh, to the coefficient of 10. Because what we have right now is that we have a full-fledged revolt in our hands. Anytime you have the three persons at the top of the ham in the Republican Party, and they are Donald Trump, Ben Carson, and Kali Feriana, and in the Democratic Party, he ain't going to get it. But there's, there's an insurgency going on in the Democratic Party, too. It's just unfortunate they got this socialist over there telling us he's a Democratic socialist as if, you, as if that goes in the same Senate. I'd like to know what he morphed, because um, isn't he supposed to be registered as an independent? Last time I already saw his name on C-SPAN, and he was talking, <laughs> it's like uh, Bernie Sanders, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah. independent. I yeah, mean, isn't that something? I mean, one time he voted opposite of the Democratic Party, so that makes him independent thinker. Yeah, know? right, right. One time. He caucused with the Democrats, so... I mean, what, what, and what is the Democratic Party today anyway, John? What, what's your best guess about what the Democratic Party um, is? They are socialists. <laughs> I mean, they are socialists. I mean, they, they don't want people to realize that what Bernie says is actually what they're really wanting, but they're saying, oh, no, no, it's we've got to push Hillary. Cause, and I, another thing is, I, I'm going to have to ask women this. I mean, they say that she's such a strong woman. She was a failure in everything she's ever done. She, the only thing she did is marry the right guy. And I'm not saying he's a good guy, but he wants more politically. 
How is she a strong woman for being married to the guy that was actually one everybody was voting for? She's a failure as the Secretary of State. She was a failure when she was on that board to you know indict you know Nixon. She, mm. she got dismissed because of her unethical and behavior and lying. So what is she good at? I yeah. don't understand what her track record makes that outsta her outstanding. I She's good at overlooking her husband's um, fidel infidelity and overlooking his treatment of women that she claims that she is, in fact, trumping their cause. I mean, compare. I thought this was over the top, comparing the Republican Party to those who are treating women over in the Middle East. <clears throat> I mean, it's an outrage. And women should... Well, I'm not going to say what women should do, but I, but I think we have to look at this in terms of what that means, in terms of how this is disrespectful of these claims that women are mistreated here on the level of mistreatment women are facing over there with these uh, barbarians. Just, but, that's, but that's what they have to do because they have to hold their constituents in, in place and I think that's what I was saying earlier. That's what I was saying earlier. I think that's why CNN and certainly CNN is not going to be uh, anywhere beholden to trying to get the Republicans uh, nominated uh, to the point that they can have a candidate running strongly in the general election, in November of 2016. And they're not going to be trying to feather that cap. So, but to have a woman on on the on the dais and have her, and she's a very articulate woman, very smart woman, by the way. And have her running in this, <clears throat> in on that stage, running for president with those men, and there's a woman up there running in the Republican Party. That kills that narrative that this is about these men that are trying to stop on the rights of women. There's a woman up there on the stage. You can't you can't say that in the same sentence. So they want to have her in the second tier and hide her off and get out of the way. But her numbers right now are showing she's third in the in the polls. So I don't know how you, you had her in the second tier in the second uh, debate that they have. <clears throat> and it's interesting that Ben Carson and Donald Trump are going neck and neck. And I prefer, quite frankly, uh, Donald Trump to Ben Carson. I think Ben Carson is a good, a good, a good person. <clears throat> but I think, you have to, I think that when you have a Donald Trump that's actually been out there in the trenches, I don't mean necessarily in a political office, <clears throat> but in the trenches dealing with these politicians, I think that he's better qualified for the position than Ben Carson. But Ben Carson should be in the administration. Can I, can I tell you what I think uh, we should have in the in in the top tier of a Republican administration? Here, here's my here's my my list. <clears throat> I think here's here's my here are my choices. And you can take it for what it's worth. It is, this is not written in concrete because I'm willing to do, do a lot of changing around as long as somebody's at the top that's not a politician. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do with the politician at the top of the list also. But let me see what I think would be a, a very good resume for the American people. Because I think the American people are ready to break out of this mold of having these career politicians. Nothing but a bunch of crooks up there in Washington. Every last one of them. Every last one of them. And I hate to tell you this because you're not going to like this. There are no exceptions. And I, and I can prove that. <clears throat> excuse me. I can prove that by what's going on right now with this Iranian deal. Because there's not one person in Congress right now that's called this president on the charade that's being run. Nothing but theatrics. This is nothing but theatrics. They have allowed this president to suborn Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2 of the Constitution. Everything they're doing up there with this agreement is unconstitutional. You can't do an executive agreement on a treaty between and make it a, 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 a deal between the president and the people in a foreign country and, and give uh, Congress, basically the senators, no role to play in it because you can veto their verdict. That is absolutely an outrage. And there's not one person in Congress that has raised this outrage before the American people. That's why I know they're, they're corrupt. All of them. Go read Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2. 
So the thing is, the Republicans are allowing him a greater latitude than they would have any other president because they don't want to be called racist. They don't want to be called racist. That's what it is all about. I mean, he is doing. He's stretched his ability way beyond the you know the uh, the uh, the attention and the framework of the Constitution. Way beyond it. Yeah, that's way true, John. It. it is. It is a racial. Um, they are afraid of the racial accusation, but part of it too is their corruption, where they don't adhere to the Constitution either unless they realize that they will be caught at their complicity in it. Now, for example, they don't dare suborn the constitutional process and at the same time don't have cover to cover their base. Because I'll tell you what's going on with the Iranian deal. Two-thirds of the American people are against it. Sixty-six percent at least of the American people are against this deal. Which means that when they go back home they got to have some cover for why they allowed this deal to go forward when their constituencies are against it. I, I, and the way they do that, John, let me say this right here, and then I'll, I'll definitely want to hear what you have to say about it. And the way they got, it, got through that is that the threshold by being an executive agreement, which is unconstitutional in this, in this particular uh, process, the threshold has been they only need 34 persons for it to carry because if any, if the president objects to it, they put the president in a position of being able to veto it and then you have to override the veto and all they need in order to sustain the veto is 34 votes. That's how they did that. That part. None of that's constitutional. Well, I, I've, I've brought this up to progressives, and they'll say to me, well, you know, foreign policy is something that is in the hands of the administration more. It should be more. And I'm, I, I don't, I said it's the Constitution says that they got to have, you know, approval of Congress. And it, they, they, when it comes in regards to uh, Obama, it's like, um, no, it, it doesn't concern you. Basically, that's the mentality of the progressives I'm dealing with. Yeah, uh, it doesn't concern you. You don't, you don't know the full details. Well, guess what? They don't what? know it, John. And, and the progressives don't know. Well, what do the uh, progressives know? When I hear a, a progressive talking, I'm, lis I'm talking, I'm listening to a person that does, that's uninformed about everything, including this stuff they're talking about with the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment, talking about it, grant citizenship to uh, those who put a toe over here one minute before the baby is born. If the baby is born in, in, the, in this country, the baby becomes a citizen of, of the United States. Nonsense. And anyone reads the, the 14th Amendment, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about reading... Uh, down very much below the beginning point of it, the first two sentences of it shows it's not, not to be true. But let me read you Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, and let you see what, what that says here. I'm going to tell you why it says this, and why you can tell that this process is corrupt and unconstitutional, and it goes beyond their uh, not wanting to be accused of racism. They are complicit because they'll go along with this, with this, with this deal that exposes the security of this country to this very bogus uh, treaty that's signed by Iran, drawn up by Iran, agreed to by Iran, just so they can claim that they did something. Here's the, here's the process. And go read it for yourself in Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2. It says, He shall, meaning the President, shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. Now let me explain to you why. If the president as it's intended in the Constitution is ratified in 1788 Although the way you elect senators was changed in 1913 with the 17th Amendment, the fact that senators in Article 2, Section 2, having to, uh, Clause 2, having to approve the treaty, that was not changed by the 17th Amendment. Only the way you elect senators. The part about senators have to approve the treaty, that remains. Now, why did they put that in there in the, in the Constitution? It's because when the president representing the federal government goes and and signs agreement to bring about a treaty in the United States before the treaty is approved it has to be approved by the senators and who were the senators at that time they were the representatives of the states you see the members of the house representatives in article 1 section 2 those are the ones in 
the House of Representatives that's, that's set up in Article 1, Section 2. Article 1, Section 1 sets up the legislative branch of government. But Article 1, Section 2 sets up the House of Representatives. And you know Article 1, Section 3 sets up the Senate. So the House is a people's body and they go before the people to be reelected as a way of holding them accountable every two years because the people's voice is important but the voice of the states is the one that's setting it up so their voice is more primary. And I'll prove that in just a minute. <clears throat> so the idea was the president on the federal level makes an agreement tentative but the tentative agreement must be approved by the senators, which means then must be approved by the states. It takes two-thirds of the states to concur. Now, if they do concur, then that verdict and agreement with the president will not be vetoed. But why, why would he veto it? Because he, they agree with the president. But if the two-thirds do not concur with it, and they disagree with the president because the state's representatives are saying no to it, then the verdict is final. There's no veto possibility in that. Why? Because the, the state's voice was supposed to be the primary voice. Why? Because the states are the ones that created the federal government. Let me prove that that was the way it was intended. That is to say, they had, the framers had a vision of how it was to play out. And that vision is being subverted by what is happening in Washington right now. And you see that in terms of this. The people's representatives stay in the House two years, and every two years go before the people as a total body to be reconfigured in the House or to be turned out of the House in total if you want to. You can throw out 435 people out of the House at one time. And they come before you every two years when what they did is still fresh in your, in your, in your memory. <clears throat> but in the Senate, they serve six years. But because they are at the beck and call of the states, the legislatures, they can then pull them out at any time if it behooves them to do so because they serve at the pleasure of the states by the agreement of the state legislature subject to recall at any point in time. That was changed in, in 1913 with the 17th Amendment. But the process of treaty ratification though has not been changed. And none of them are speaking to the process is spelled out in Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2. Now, are there some of them that don't understand the process? Probably so, because we're not talking about rocket, rocket scientists here. But does Cruz understand it? Yes, he does. Do the others, like Lee from Utah, does he understand it? Lee understands it. What about Rand Paul? Rand Paul understands it. So we talk about, and uh, what about Dempsey down there in South Carolina? The one that was saying the, the Confederate flag is part of the heritage. And when they went and uh, began the, the, the tide change, all of a sudden the flag was racist, got to come down, got to zoom the bodies, got to move people around, can't have uh, Jefferson Davis anywhere to be seen, got to move his statue around, dig up these bodies, exhume the bodies of Nathan Forrest. In, in Memphis, all oh, that, that got to go on. Got to get the flag out of here. Got to put it in the museum. And he's down with that because he's, that's the way he is. Everybody running for Congress, I'm, I'm already in Congress, everybody run, that's in Congress running for president, right there on that basis alone, they should be disqualified. Sorry about that. They should be disqualified. Cannot be trusted. And that includes Ted Cruz, who I, like, who I do like but in another capacity. I don't like him as president. That disqualifies. You see, it's, look, we are at a critical mass right now. It's one striking you out. Here's, my, here's my, my, my list. Donald Trump, president. Kali Feriana, vice president. Secretary of State, Ted Cruz. Secretary of HHS, Health and Human Services, Ben Carson. Secretary of Defense, Alan West. Attorney General, I got one for that one. 
Everybody else is saying uh, Trey Gowdy. No, not Trey Gowdy, because you see, we got racial politics being played. We didn't, we need a black person in that position, because you get out there with with that Black Lives Matter. We got to have you talk, talk about uh, speaking truth to power. We got to have somebody to speak truth to these Negroes. And that person is none other than a Milwaukee County Sheriff who speaks as straight as an arrow. The man is after my own heart. And that's the great David Clark. This fit cut out for that job that'll put Eric Holter to shame in the way he runs that office. And also this woman is in office right now because it's not about gender. It's about fairness. You know, he reminds me of that, Clark. He reminds me of the uh, guy who played Trevet on uh, Walker, Walker, Texas Ranger. Straight arrow, <laughs> straight shooter, very honest. Yeah, very, you, you, very, you notice that. Yeah, just, to me, it's like he's like, oh, is that who they pattern? Does he pattern himself as yeah, that character? You know, whoever, whoever the, the mold is, the, the model of it is, we used to find that mold and put some other folks in it because one thing you find out when he's up there talking, he doesn't care who the person is, he got to critique. The President of the United States, I saw him speak before a group of people. I don't know where that convention was here, but where it was in NRA. And he comes out on the stage and salutes, and he goes to that microphone, and he does not take any prisons. I, I like a man like that, that can speak with, with a clear voice, a straight message, and don't finesse it because it's not politically correct. So at the top of the pyramid, I think, I think Donald Trump, because Donald Trump, you got to go in there. Look, there's a cesspool in Washington, D.C. In America, I think you're waking up. I really do. I think you're finally getting what, what we've been trying to say here at AllPointsTV.com. We're just saying it here. Other folks are saying it also. The Tea Party has been saying it. And I think you find, you know, is it sinking in? As Jim, that was uh, Clark in that film called, um, in that film um, that they had on that. Um, program where he was the principal of the school and he asked the students is it sinking in and and the, the students yeah well folks I think it's sinking in finally we have got to stand up because this is a fight and you know what right now is happening we have right now a